Welcome to Jesus Changes Everything, a daily podcast dedicated to providing a fresh look at the ancient and glorious truth that Jesus not only reigns, but is busy about the business of bringing all things under subjection, that celebrates the wonder and the glory that he has been given all authority in heaven and on earth. All along the way in our ongoing series, Proper Theology, we have certainly taken the time to uh, examine and talk about some of the uh, historically understood attributes of God. We've talked about his omnipotence, about his omniscience. We talked about his immutability, about his aseity. All of those things are good and fitting and proper, and there's not a thing in the world wrong with considering those things. As long as, of course, we remember the simplicity of God, uh, that God is not a string of attributes, but that he is one. Well, we've also, however, uh, sought to take a little bit more of a personal approach to remember precisely that God isn't a string of attributes or a list of capabilities, but that he's personal, that he's relational. And that's why for today's proper uh theology, I would like us to remember this glorious biblical truth that we find in Psalm 34, verse 18, where we read, the Lord is near to those who have a broken heart and saves such as have a contrite spirit. The Lord is near to the brokenhearted and saves such as have a contrite spirit. That's who he is. That is his nature. The Lord does not despise a broken heart. He doesn't look down his nose at a broken heart. Jesus, we're told, would not Uh, extinguish a smoldering wick or break a bruised reed. There's a tenderness that's coupled with a nearness, a closeness, an imminence to God. He draws close to us in our brokenhearted state. Now, the irony is this, that for the Christian... The deepest pain imaginable is when we lack that sense of his nearness, when we go through what others have called the dark night of the soul, where we seek him and we feel like we can't find him. I've been there. I suspect you've been there. Probably all God's children have been there. And it is anguishing, difficult thing. But one of the things that we're called to, friends, in in living in light of our faith is to believe what God says even when it doesn't feel true to us. When the Bible says God is near to the brokenhearted, If you go back and check the original Hebrew, and if you do your research and break it down and check out all of your resources and do your word studies, you'll discover that that text, that when you translate it, it means the Lord is near to the brokenhearted. Just like it says. It doesn't say the Lord makes himself felt to be near to the brokenhearted. It doesn't say the brokenhearted will know that he's near or feel that he's near. No, the text says that he is near. And so when I'm in those moments, my calling is to remind myself of the truths that I know 
in my prayers, Lord, I don't feel you close. I don't feel you near. I feel you distant. And I, I feel like my prayers uh, stop at the ceiling. But you, O oh Lord, are a God who ever and always speaks the truth. And you have told us that you are near to the brokenhearted. Lord, you know my heart is broken. And so I must affirm that you are near. I can ask the Lord to help me feel it more. Of course I can. And by the way, I can know that he hears me. I've said it before. I'll say it again. You don't need to worry if your prayers hit the ceiling. Because they're not traveling from you up to heaven. Because he's already right there with you. He's under the ceiling with you. He hears our prayers. Because he's near. Time and again, I have felt the weight of the desire inside me to help me and every other believer come to a deeper understanding of the depth and the scope and the reality and the precision of the love of God for every one of his children. Because when we get that, when we know that, when we own that, then we're able to push back against that feeling that he's not there. Well, he's not there. He's here. He's here with us. Today I've spent some time recording seconds for the Jesus Changes Everything podcast. But I've also been in prayer. I've been in prayer for loved ones. I've been in prayer for those who are mourning. I've been in, pr in prayer for those who are sick. And the joy is not only that he's with me, but that he's with them. When you fret and worry about loved ones, if they are in Christ, you can be assured that the Lord is with them. When you're fretting and worrying yourself, you have that same assurance. Who is God? God is the one who draws near to the brokenhearted. We come now to question 40 of the Westminster Shorter Catechism in our ongoing series, looking at just these things. And I want to just take a minute today to remind you about why we're doing this. Uh, it is <clears throat> my conviction that the Westminster Shorter Catechism is an outstanding uh, brief summary of the Christian faith delivered to us in bite-sized pieces of questions and answers. Uh, my desire in these segments is just to unpack uh, the answers just a little bit each time so we get a little bit of a fuller picture. And my hope is, of course, that I'm being faithful to the spirit in which these things were written and the convictions of those who wrote them. Question 40 asks this question, what did God at first reveal to man for the rule of his obedience? And the answer is the rule which God at first revealed to man for his obedience was the moral law. Now, it is commonly held that the law of God can be divided up into three parts. What we call the moral law, which is what is referenced here, uh, the ceremonial law, and the civil law. And the distinctions among these are, are thus. The moral law uh, describes what is right, what we're supposed to do, what God requires of us. The ceremonial law describes the laws having to do with God setting his people apart for himself, sacraments, the sacrificial system. Uh, so circumcision would be a part of the ceremonial law, which is one of the reasons it became such an issue in the first century church as they tried to understand, is this still with us or not still with us? Then the civil law is that law which describes the obligations of the state 
uh, with respect to punishing evildoers. So for instance, when uh, Noah gets off the ark and God says to him, among other things, if a man sheds a man's blood, by man shall his blood be shed. This is the establishment not only of civil government, but this is the establishment of the principle of capital punishment. You kill somebody, God's law says, the civil law says you need to be put to death. And because this is given to Noah, we would argue this applies to all men everywhere because we're all descendants of Noah. So when the uh, fathers say here that we're obligated, the first law that God gave was a moral law. They're talking about uh, the law that describes what is right and what is wrong, uh, that is in essence uh, revealed in the created order and is made aware uh, it is made aware to us through our conscience it doesn't take a message from god for a person no matter how backwards they might be for a person to know it's wrong uh, to sneak into somebody's home and kill them or to sneak into somebody's home and take their stuff Everyone knows that's wrong. We may try to deny it. We may try to suppress it. We may try to rationalize it and excuse it. But God has revealed this. We know it. We're aware of it. And God did this for Adam and for Eve and for everybody ever since then. You know, when uh, God comes and asks Cain where Abel is, uh, Cain's response is not, well, I killed him. And then when God, you know, rebuked him, he didn't say, well, I didn't know that was wrong. You never told us that. Well, if I were to look into your plan, it says here that you're not going to be telling God's people not to commit murder for thousands of years. Well, it's not true. Of course he knew it was wrong to commit murder. Just like we all know it's wrong to steal. Now, can our consciences be uh, misinformed? Absolutely. Can our consciences be, uh, what's the word for it, sort of uh, numbed? Uh, Absolutely. In fact, uh, typically, the more uh, common a sin is, whether common in our own life or common in the life of those around us, the, the less we tend to see or feel the weight of the seriousness of that sin. But that doesn't change the fact that God has revealed to us what he requires. In fact, what did God respond to uh, Cain again when Cain was, uh, his ceremonial laws uh, were not well done. So Cain brings his offering, God's not pleased with it, and Cain gets grumpy about it. And what does God say? Hey, all you had to do was do what I asked. If you do what I ask, I'd have been pleased, but you're not doing what I ask. So, why does God do this? Well, I want you to remember that this is grace. This is actually not law. In fact, we have that principle in our civil law. The principle is that the ignorance of the law is no excuse. If I go and rob a bank and they come and arrest me, and I I can't say, stand in the courtroom and say, "I, I didn't know that was wrong. I mean, I know that if I drive more than uh, the speed limit, that that's wrong because you post the speed limit. But there was no sign at the bank saying, don't steal. How was I supposed to know? Ignorance of the law is no excuse. And so God has every right to impose obligation on us to keep his law without even having the kindness to tell us what it is. And so it is kindness when he does reveal it to us which makes it that much worse when we defy him. The moral law is a reflection of who God is. And our obligation was before the fall, after the fall, before we're saved, after we're saved. Our obligation is ever and always to submit to it. It is the rule revealed to us for our obedience. What is it that makes a hero? Well, in this segment of heroes you never heard of, I want to make the case that heroism is more about 
what you fight against than what you succeed in doing. That is, what defines the hero is overcoming the odds. And I mention that because today's hero that I'd like to introduce you to is someone indeed that you have probably never heard of. Unless, of course, you have been following uh, me or my precious wife, Lisa, on Facebook or on Twitter and uh, are aware that she just recently passed away. I'm speaking of Sharon K. Bertram, my mother-in-law, the mother of my precious wife. Now, Sharon was a tiny little woman who lived in a small house in an ordinary neighborhood in a Midwestern town. But she was a hero. Not because of what she accomplished, but because of what she overcame. This is a woman whose first husband, my wife's father, passed away after just a few years of marriage. Which husband was unkind and harsh and abused her? But Sharon fought on like the unsinkable Molly Brown. And she eventually remarried. And she and her husband, Steve, had their own hardships, their own struggles, their own challenges. And Sharon carried on. Eventually, my dear wife moved out of the home, and eventually her younger brother moved out of the home, and it was just Steve and Sharon. And they continued to struggle. Eventually, it came time for Steve to retire. And when he did, they continued to struggle. And then Steve... passed away. That was four years ago. Now, by this time, my mother-in-law was pretty well housebound. She had an addiction to nicotine that left her lungs badly beaten. And she was on oxygen. And she had COPD. And she had uh, aneurysms. But she continued on. I didn't know Sharon K. Bertram especially well. She lived several hours away from where we are. But the way I got to know her was by listening to her as she and my precious wife, Lisa, would talk on the phone several times a day. Lisa would call and check on her. How are you doing, Mom? How are you sleeping? What are you doing, Mom? What, what did you make for your meals? And every time, Sharon would answer the questions and she would demonstrate that she was, in fact, pressing on. She did struggle with loneliness. She did struggle with not having a husband and not having a man in the house. She had cats, an appropriate number of cats. She wasn't the cat lady, but she had an appropriate number of cats. On the high side of appropriate, but still appropriate. And eventually, she had to lose those too. They had kept her company in the loss of her husband. But she carried on. She carried on and she carried on. She wasn't raised in the church. She wasn't uh, she didn't have a radical late in life conversion, but she did have a conversion. Her son and her daughter would speak to her about Jesus, would talk to her about the reality of sin. 
she would every Monday night tune in online to our weekly Bible study. And she continued and struggled on. She was a profoundly fearful woman. But when the pain of her aneurysm grew to be too much, and we called the ambulance, and the ambulance came, and uh, she didn't want to go because she was afraid. But she went. And when that hospital said, we can't take care of you, we got to send you to another hospital in a helicopter, she went. And she went through a surgery she was not expected to survive, but she carried on. A second surgery was required, and she carried on. And then her heart gave out. I had the privilege and the honor of preaching Sharon's funeral. I didn't say this, which I should have. Sharon fought the good fight. She finished the race. And Jesus met her. You've been listening to the Jesus Changes Everything podcast, a production of Dunamis Fellowship, the teaching outreach of Dr. R.C. Sproul Jr. If you've enjoyed this podcast, we encourage you to subscribe, which you can do at all the usual outlets, to tell your friends, and to spread the word. To learn more about the work of Dunamis Fellowship, please visit rcsproljr.com and join us next time on Jesus Changes Everything.